Welcome to Campfire Chronicles, episode number four. It is August 28th, and it is 9.43 p.m. on a Friday. <laughs> and I am Robbie. Who do I have here in Ohio? This is Andrew Lynn. And this is Homer Simpson. I mean, Brian Lynn. <laughs> and who do we have in California? I'm back, and this is Thomas. Excellent. Um, thank you all for watching our videos, subscribing, liking, and sharing. Please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash adventure. You can donate money and get to see episodes early, but you don't have to do that. You can always watch them later, but you get to see them early, which we have an episode coming up in September. We don't know when yet because we haven't even started editing, but it's going to be from Yosemite, and it's going to be great. Indeed. I can't wait. Agreed. I can't wait. Okay, so um, last week we answered some questions, right? Oh, yeah, but there was one question we were saving for this week. And that is, how do we film an episode? And this is asked by so, Stan Stonelin. Stan, okay, yeah, well, I think that's how you say it. Thank you, Stan, for that wonderful question. <laughs> oh, wait, no. <laughs> I think a I'm, lot of people I'm, want to I'm know I'm wrong, this. actually. That was uh, James Bolton. James Never Sink Bolt, out, yeah. Outdoor. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong question. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I knew that they were curious about it. So um, I think we should just start with saying what it was like when we first went out to film the first two original pilots <laughs> that we tried to do at Hocking Hills and Land Between the Lakes. Why don't you tell us about that, Andrew? Uh, well, I remember at Hocking Hills we had your Canon and then my point and shoot and just a flimsy little plastic tripod, which we actually used on the episodes too. But we got there, we got out of the car. We were really excited as we walked down to that trail. And then we were like trying to film lots of shots, but there were so many people there. And then we, I, I remember actually like climbing up on this rock to get a good shot, but there were just so many people and I don't think well, we felt. Well, let's back up just a little bit uh -huh. because I forgot about a really important thing is that part of what has inspired us to do this was that you used to watch bushcraft videos all the time on YouTube, right? Yeah. And about in 2010, I got a Canon T3i, which for those who don't know is a DSLR camera that gives you a really shallow depth of field which makes it look like a film camera from a, any movie. Like, it's where mm. the background is blurry, but something else is in focus. And so we make videos. We make dumb videos all the time. But Andrew was like, yo, we could make a really amazing bushcraft video with great production values that would be really fun to watch. And we were already doing these things called good times videos, <laughs> which were just... These five-minute videos, which were just like, uh, it's like kind of like what Adventure Archives is, only with like more music, right? It's like embellished slideshows, kind of like. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and we've been doing that since uh, 2006. I think that was the f I, I took an After Effects class, and I suddenly it suddenly hit me. I was like, oh, I should do that with some of the trips we did. But anyways, yeah. So we had the camera, we had the idea to go, and we went to Hocking Hills. And as you said, we were trying to get the shots, and it wasn't good. So what else happened after that? <laughs> well, so we went on the main trail and eventually decided to turn back and leave to try to find a less crowded trail. <laughs> and we filmed ourselves, like, stopped on the road in the middle of the country just, like, talking to the camera for, like, 12 minutes or something. And then we um, drove to another trail. I think it was Conkles Hollow, maybe? Um, but we were, like, hiking through the forest. It was a lot more, lot, lot more solitude there, and it was really beautiful, but... I think in the end, just because it was like a trip where you drive around to a campsite, it ended up not being anything. And um, by the time we got to the campsite and it was like nighttime, we hadn't filmed much and we just sort of like decided we weren't going to film tomorrow. We were just going to go home. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we talk about what we actually bring? So like, what did we bring on the Hocking Hills trip as far as camera gear and stuff to actually film the episode. I mean, it was just, wasn't it just your T3i, my point and shoot, and a tripod? No, we had the steady cam as well. Oh, really? Uh, there's a YouTuber named Devin Supertramp, and he does these amazing videos with the same steady cam that we use. It's a different model, but it produces really smooth shots. And so we didn't even know how to balance it at that point, but we brought the steady cam, tripod, and then the, yeah, the T3i. So when we go out, we have. Lots of extra batteries. We found that out really quickly that uh, one or two batteries is not enough. <laughs> and there's nowhere to charge, obviously. Oh, are you talking about what we bring now? or, or during? No, I'm talking about then. Oh, we brought okay. a yeah, steady yeah. cam at Hocking Hills. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. There's a particular shot, actually, that turned out really well of you walking. Oh, I remember that you now. Remember? Yeah, walking okay, in the creek. Yeah. You, know, you know, actually, I really want to edit that pilot together and see if we can turn it into something 
at least halfway decent. <laughs> well, our other attempt was also at Land Between the Lakes, but, that, but as we talked about before, there were like too many people and the weather was terrible and the miscuities were terrible. So Yeah, so I think the... I mean, Brian and Thomas, feel free to jump in anytime if you guys have specific thoughts. But I think the one thing that we learned really quickly from Hawking Hills and Land Between the Lakes is that when you film for actual a positive viewing experience, like you're not just like randomly filming and you want to like you have a specific like vision in mind, there's a lot more work involved than what you realize mm-hmm. because you have to not what you realize, but what we realize because we found out really quickly that. Just any type of good shot, you have to set it up, and it takes a minute to set the tripod up, takes some effort, and then you actually have to line it up really well, and it takes like, that's like two minutes, right? So two minutes to get the camera set up, then you actually just do the like five second shot, then you have to go back, get the camera, and the whole time that you're doing, that you're hiking, you're constantly on the lookout for oh, is this going to be a good shot? Is that going to be a good shot? What if we did this? And, what if and we do one this? hard part about that is like, at least for me, everything looks amazing. So I'm like, I get this like <laughs> yeah. sort of anxiety, like, okay, I want to just film it all. But at the same time, I also don't want to film anything. <laughs> I think one of the biggest hurdles <laughs> let me, let me. that we had to overcome in our initial videos was the fact that we had to adjust to the fact, had to adjust to the fact that we had to film Whereas we were used to, you know, just walking and hiking and enjoying the scenery. Uh, I think like what what Robbie said, we didn't realize just how much work that entailed. So when you do factor in the video, you know, taking the videos, you probably cut the amount of hiking and things that you do by half. And we just didn't realize that in the beginning. So, you know, you don't get enough shots or you just don't put enough effort towards it. I think that's why a lot of our later videos are a lot better is because we we have that mindset we know just how much effort needs to be put forth and another thing is like not just the physical effort but also like the mental preparation like even in our first dolly sods episode you could tell me and robbie were really camera shy and like just the the mental effort to both be on camera but also like not care about what other people think while you're filming things like like at hawking hills yeah, and land between the lakes part of it was like oh our friends are with us or like these other people you know we're here yeah i think taking up that's time. really something you have to do is like when we actually prepared for that at, at yosemite there's a specific scene that i won't spoil but before we did it like we before we actually started we prepared ourselves and said okay if people come and they're watching and seeing what we're doing we have to ignore them or even use that as like fuel to do it even more enthusiastically yeah, yeah. Because then you start to get self-conscious, and then the shot gets ruined, and then it's just... Speaking of which, again. I would love to hear well, Thomas's thoughts on our filming process, since it, Yosemite was the first time he's actually gone on, like, a full episode. Oh, oh my god. So, I, I go hiking a lot. I, I go hiking a lot, and a lot of the times I go hiking, I don't actually film it just because I like to hike. So, the week before I went to Yosemite, I did Mount Baldy, and I actually made it to the summit with some of my friends. Did no filming at all. It was about 10 miles, at least, with 3,000 feet elevation. And that was a hard, hard hike. Jump forward a week, we're in Yosemite. We're doing three miles, about 2,500 feet elevation gain. It's supposed to be easier, but these guys are stopping every 10 minutes to get a, to get a shot. And yeah, it's beautiful. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> But it's like I just started hiking. I got my I got my you know I got my groove on and it's done. We got to stop. We got to set up this shot. I was just blown away by how much effort these guys put into getting some shots. It's just it's it's really frustrating if you're trying to like go if you're trying to hike and just keep going and going and going. But these guys they're just like no, we got to get the shot. And I I when at the time I just you know I did the best to. Uh, hold my tongue but afterwards when we were reviewing the shots i'm like ah all right (laughs) that makes sense yeah it always becomes worth it afterwards like if you don't know what's going on i think um i I don't know about you guys but i've sort of gotten used to doing it to where i can tell if we're getting enough shots and i'm like oh yeah so it's like it's the activity itself has actually become quite rewarding whereas at the beginning it was just like oh man i I hate having to set up the camera blah 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 Mm -hmm. but now it's like really satisfying because you know 
what you're doing it for. Yeah. I will say that after every trip, I still have this nagging paranoia where I'm like, I don't think we filmed anything. Like, did, I, did we actually film anything? Like, <laughs> And then you, it, it and then you look at the 400 gigabytes worth of full <laughs> SD cards. <laughs> like, literally every time after every episode, I'm like, oh, crap, dude, this is going to be garbage. Like, what were we doing? We didn't say anything. All it is is just a bunch of dumb shots of us walking and showing our dumb backs. <laughs> like, literally, that's what I think every single time. I got a question for you guys. Because, you know, this is the first time I actually got to go on a trip with you and see your filming process. How how do you motivate yourself to go, to, you know, to keep going? Because, you know, for me, it's just like I get in this mentality of I just I just keep hiking and hiking. And then I hit this moment where I just can I feel like I don't have to ever stop. But with you guys, you, you go and like just as that like once you're about to break that threshold you're like oh we got to stop take that oh, shot how do you yeah. motivate yourself to keep going after that you know i i get what you're saying because sometimes when i like run and then i stop to turn around or something like that i like lose all the wind but with hiking i don't mm -hmm. feel that as much for me it's like stopping to film is almost like being able to take a little breather um but i'll also say that i've just like we've edited enough of these episodes and like had all like late nights of frustration where we're like why didn't we get that shot like what the hell were we thinking um for every episode really and then so i think like part of it is we're just like so used to it and so we know that it's worth it at this point that we're just motivated to like take the shot and then keep walking i think that it's when, when you stop periodically to take the shots it's also kind of um well, I don't, I don't like hiking long distances. And, you know, when I, when I notice that when I do hike long distance, I end up just staring at my feet the whole time and like my mind wanders. But when you, when we do stop periodically to film, you actually get time to, you know, realize and take in where you are and take in your surroundings and actually enjoy the scenery. Um, so I think that's what kind of pushes me is that you know, it's actually more enjoyable to be able to stop and, and see what you're doing rather than thinking of hiking as reaching some destination, um, you know, in a matter of time. So for me, uh, I haven't really thought about it because I don't really need motivation to hike. It's because I don't think distance has ever been like a goal of ours. Like, oh, we're going to do 20 miles today or 10 miles. It's always just more about the journey and like that's really good because in just about every other aspect of my life, it's always about the goal. It's never about the journey, right? Mm -hmm. And the journey is like the most important part because that's the time you, that's what you spend the most time doing. So I guess like when we're filming, it's, it just, I, I don't need any motivation because that is the motivation to just film and hike and everything. Plus I'm also one of those people who just, I think video is kind of like one of my callings because I love seeing things like we call it living and reliving, <laughs> but you do something, you film it. And then immediately afterwards you watch what you just filmed <laughs> and it's like having your cake and eating it too, because you get to experience it and you get to rewatch it. It's great. Well, great. That answers that. Thanks. So uh, were there any moments that like stuck out as particularly frustrating when we were filming in Yosemite? I'm trying to think. For me, for me, you, you guys know I, I like to hike a lot, and I was I, I can't remember, but I felt like especially going up that last. Well, I don't want to spoil anything, but there were a bunch of switchbacks at one point. We were going up, and I just did not want to stop because if I knew I stopped, it would take almost as much energy to keep, you know, to to get that inertia going again, as it would for me just to you know finish the hike to the top as was. And every time we got to a point where I just, I don't want to say got that hiker's high, but, you know, just kind of got into my zone, uh, we'd stop, we'd take a beautiful shot, and then I'd have to go pick up the pace again. Yeah. Okay, well, I have a question for you, Thomas. For me, like, I'm, like, I have to commend you for being able to do videos by yourself because a lot of the inspiration and, like, the, the motivation to go out and film for us is like we feed off of each other's energy, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, like Andrew will have an idea, Brian will have an idea, or I'll have an idea, and then we'll like be like, oh, yeah, let's do this, let's do that. But by yourself, like it's just you. You have to be the complete source of your inspiration. So when, I, when you're hiking, do you ever find yourself just like, oh, God, I don't know what to film, or I, I don't want to film, or like I don't know what to do, you know what I'm saying? 
sometimes. I'd say when I film my stuff, I, I kind of get lost in my thoughts. And then whenever I break that stream of conscious, I'm like, oh, I should film something. Oh, I'm at a cool place. Let me just stop everything and then, you know, kind of collect myself, film myself, figuring things out. So uh, when I did Wind Wolves, I just would hike, kind of like get lost in my thoughts, think about what's going on back at home. And then I'd be like, oh, this is beautiful. Let me, <laughs> as I am here taking in the scenery, why don't I show me actually taking in the scenery? So it's, it's, I don't know. You guys, you guys have a lot more creativity, inspiration and stuff. I, I, my stuff is raw. And so it's like, I just I'm like, Oh cool. Let me just stick the camera down and here I go. Well, I, I guess with us, uh, we also like have to worry about making sure it's the right length and stuff to sort of to an extent. But yeah, that's, that's that. I just, I just kind of reflect my own hiking breaks in my shots. I guess with cool. that, should we get into the nitty gritty? Okay, so why don't we go ahead and run through one day of filming and talk about what all shots we generally try to hit every single time mm -hmm. that we're filming. So, Andrew, why don't you explain that a little bit? Um, well, so for a camping trip where we're first getting there, um, I always find myself sort of getting lost on the car ride there and then suddenly remembering, oh, wait, we need to start filming immediately, like as soon as we get there, like... Because we got to film ourselves getting out of the car, getting our things packed, even if we don't use that shots. Not necessarily even when we get there. We 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 try to do a lot of filming before we get there, like some yeah. some of the preparation and, and some of the car ride there. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a really exciting moment. Is like when we first get there and you jump out of the car, mm -hmm. and then like muscle memory takes over, and you're like, oh yeah, I remember what to do now. <laughs> and then you just start filming this, and you're like, let's do this and let's do that. That's like an exciting time. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's one of those things where, and this happens later in the day, um, but like where you're just doing something and then you suddenly realize wait everything needs to be filmed like i can't just do this i need to film it <laughs> yeah yeah when we went to uh smokies uh, actually with any trip but particularly with smokies it's like you get to the place and i'd be thinking like all right so we got to get some maps we got to get some registrations i'll be like getting ready to go over there to the booth to get the registration you're like whoa, 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 whoa we got to film this i'm like <laughs> yeah where are you we going gotta, <laughs> we got to film this <laughs> and like yeah we got yeah that <laughs> happens a lot if somebody's about to do something he's like i hope you don't think you're about to do that without <laughs> me filming it <laughs> that's actually one of the toughest things is uh at the end of a day when we've just reached the campsite and you're like tired i'm like man i just want to set up my yeah, yeah. tent and and cook some food and you're like nope no, yeah, wait, you're just we sitting there this. waiting to do. <laughs> you're to like, do you're the like, thing. We're like sitting there waiting to cook some food, and the person setting up the camera. And you're like, come on, come on. <laughs> um, so anyway, after we like get our things packed and we're hiking, one of the things we always look for is like where the environment changes. So like, you'll be walking on a road, then the trailhead. You want to capture that. Then if you're in a like, take Red River Gorge for example. We're in the forest, but then the path goes uphill and it opens up, and there's rocks. You have to make sure you film these environment changes so that there's like a, a transition in the story from one scene to the next, sort of. With hiking shots, it's it's really easy to fall into this pattern of just getting a lot of shots from behind of us walking forward and forgetting to get more creative shots that make it more interesting. Yeah, that's one thing you always got to be mindful of is like doing something you haven't done before and like constantly trying to like pull from your like kind of lexicon of shots and be like oh i saw that in a movie one time why don't mm -hmm. we try something like mm -hmm. this yeah just like um as an example in the first episode of dolly sods uh I, we've done it multiple times but in that episode in particular we do a composite shot where you oh, do yeah the horizon in the sky you do a time lapse so the clouds are moving really fast and then below it you do a slow motion shot of the people walking that, that's a shot and i had been wanting to do for so on, long <laughs> No, I, I don't think I saw that on anything. Oh, I thought that you saw that on Survivor Man. No, actually. no, that was a shot I've been wanting to get. because Ever since we had that camera that could do the time lapse and then the other one that could do the slow-mo, I've been wanting, like, I, I kept thinking, what if I went to a field and got the grass and slow-mo sky and time lapse? Oh, dude, that's awesome. I always thought that you had pulled that from Survivor Man. We'll call so that's that the a Andrew Lynn original. Yeah, the Andrew Lynn effect. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. It's like Ken Burns. Yeah. 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 Another thing is while we're hiking, I'm constantly looking for things that are sort of interesting to talk about, plants I know or mushrooms and a lot of times i have this like slight anxiety like oh man i really hope i find this or like what if i can't find this plant and i really want to talk about it um but it usually works out more or less the like another thing that we try to do is have philosophy right and it's a, that kind of stems from just when we talk regularly we're always talking about different philosophy and like we're 
theorizing about this and that. But the kind of problem with that is that a lot of times you'll have these great conversations off camera and then you sometimes have to just force it on camera. Like, oh, wait, wait." or like we're about to talk about something really cool and we say, no, 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 don't say that. Let's set up the camera. Then let's talk about it. Yeah. And you have to get over the camera shyness and you also have to boil it down to like a less than one minute scene. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, when we talk naturally, when we're off camera, we talk naturally and we say something and it sounds like really profound or whatever. Which is what the podcast is for. (laughs) Then we boot up the camera and and like Andrew says, you become a little self-aware and you're like, wait, is what I'm saying actually make sense or is it really dumb? (laughs) Yeah. And that has gotten easier. So like just to anybody who's making videos and whether you're like seasoned professional or you're just brand new just start talking in front of the camera like if that's your weak point talking in front of the camera it gets easier and easier i think you'll notice like if you just watch our videos you can see how much more natural we've gotten and we still have like a long way to go but it just gets so much easier for some reason the more you've done it and one thing i will say is we've we always talk about these talking scenes and like a lot of times we're like man i like afterwards at least for me a lot of them i like but a lot of them i really don't like like the ones where we're just standing there talking about what we're doing, I think we've realized that those are not that interesting. Like, it's more interesting <laughs> if you're, like, sitting at an interesting area doing something and talking about something more interesting, you know? Um, yeah, when we just go, so we just crested this hill, <laughs> and now we're going to the campsite. <laughs> the end. <laughs> anyway, um, during the hike, we'll also often come to, like, a nice vista with a nice view. So we try to get, like... Those that are sort of like a standard procedure, I feel like, where we get like us walking into the camera, then we get the first person view, and then our face is looking all cheesy. <laughs> we should quickly talk about the tools, I guess. The tripod that we use is, uh, I can list the model number. It's in our all of our videos. It's the model number. Yeah, we'll there. put it in the description. But it's specifically a smooth ball head. I, I can't remember the exact term, but it allows you to get really smooth panning shots. Yeah, it like, does. Thomas, what, <laughs> how, how was it carrying that in Yosemite? <laughs> I feel like we could have had a more ergonomic tripod. <laughs> how general, much would you say that tripod weighs? I, I would guess somewhere between 10 and 15 pounds. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I'm pretty the, sure it's like, yeah, it's like 12 pounds with the head. Yeah, the problem is it's, it's, not the, it's not the heaviness that's the problem. It's just bulky, especially if you have a backpack on. Yeah, there's you, just no you, good way to comfortably carry it. You sling that thing over your shoulder, it's... it's jamming into your the, your your balance yeah. the irony and everything so is that with my old backpack it was so low that like i could just sling it over my shoulder with ease but now with the new one there's like the the lid the head crab in the way so i have to like tuck it in between like brian does when he carries it yeah i, I find that pretty comfortable <laughs> but really the thing about it is the fact that even if you do find a comfortable way to carry it you're just setting it up every three minutes so it's like you're carrying the tripod, you're comfortable, and it's like, oh, wait, we got a set of shot. Okay, okay, no, here, let's go. <laughs> yeah, it's also cumbersome when you're trying to, like, balance, keep your balance on, like, a trail that's really rocky because you, you're losing one arm to help yourself steady, and also there, it's, like, pulling the weight to one side. And also the weight itself does sort of matter to an extent. Like, after you hike for a while, you start noticing the extra weight. The new slider that we got, that I think we've only actually seen it in the Dolly Sods Winter episode that I carried. When I carried that thing, I definitely noticed a huge difference in the weight on my backpack because that thing was like, I don't know why, but I just remember, because I remember stuffing. It's so long. I yeah, I remember, well, it was, you can't sh- shorten it. And then I was stuffing it like underneath the head crab in my backpack. And I was like, man, something this is so heavy. <laughs> yeah. So the, the slider is the third piece of equipment yeah. that we sometimes use. In the early episodes, we had a homemade wooden slider that Andrew made. Yeah, which Thomas, and, a lot of credit to him because he made the one that was a lot longer and then he showed me all the things i needed and stuff so woo, woo. so the slider shots are really great they produce like these really nice shots that go from left to right but it's not just a right typical panning <laughs> shot but they're so like cumbersome to bring mm-hmm. that in the last two episodes i don't think we've even had a slider but you can kind of get away with not having one as long as you well, have a smooth flowing river for gorge head. we could have brought it i think we just forgot it that time <laughs> like, no i think we purposely left it we we definitely purposely at left least it for I purposely left it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> can 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 we can we talk about our uh, fourth and dream? Well, let, wait, did we talk uh, about the steady cam of... yet? We haven't talked about steady cam oh, yet. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Yeah, Keep the going. steady cam is actually the third piece. Well, the steady cam is the second piece. The tri- yes. the slider is the third piece. Oh, so we, we skipped never used to it. three and then came back to two. <laughs> yeah. So the slide the steady cam is the other crucial element of it. 
which gives you like just really steady walking shots so you can do movements you can go around people and, and basically just move the camera without it being a shaky mess and i don't think we perfected and, it until red river gorge right yeah i'm not even sure we've perfected it yet but as far as like the balancing of the steady cam we did not under or at least i did not understand what the balancing of the steady cam was until yeah red river gorge no the smokies the smokies i the, but the camera was too light for the smokies i couldn't even balance it mm-hmm. but anyways suffice it to say that until red river gorge the the steady cam has never been balanced properly so it hasn't been like a completely smooth shot if you notice if you look at red river gorge they're significantly smoother yeah but yeah that's just a really versatile nice piece of equipment because it's actually not too light it's a little bit cumbersome but uh it's not battery powered either so we can just use it forever Mm -hmm. and we use it all the time but there are some nice electronic ones that are more portable and i've been looking at some of those recently Mm -hmm. and they last a full day on one battery so we might eventually switch over to one of those but also we should also note that sometimes we have two cameras so like when we went to red river gorge we only had one camera Mm -hmm. That's kind of a pain because every time you want to do a steady cam you shot, switch. you need to move it to the steady cam and back to the tripod and back to steady cam. And not not to mention you have to keep rebalancing it every time you put on, put mm-hmm. it on the steady cam. Yeah, the steady cam never stays quite balanced when you take it off. Yeah. So for Yosemite, we actually rented a second camera so that way we could just have one camera on each piece of equipment. And, uh, and that makes filming so much easier. And I think the next pipe dream, as Thomas was saying, our fourth piece of equipment, Thomas. Yes, the dream piece of equipment that we're hoping to eventually get to would be a drone. <laughs> Man, yeah. that would just <laughs> take it to the next level. <laughs> and quick aside, I had ordered a drone, and it was a pre-order for the latest DJI Phantom. And we would have gotten it had they shipped it on time, but they kept delaying it. So then we didn't get it, and um, now like the parks are banning it anyway. It's like a temporary ban until oh, they figure yeah. out what they want to do with it. Yeah, because mm. drones think, are a tricky issue, man. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about it. Because on the one hand, I'm like, dude, just let us do what we want. But if there was like 50 people using drones, it'd just be a noisy mess, and it'd be terrible. Oh, they should just do permits, man. Yeah, permits. Would just be like good. the same way they do camping permits, you should just be able to like, there'd be like three people any at any given time that are allowed to use drones on each day something like that you know i'll tell you what the reason i think a drone would be awesome for adventure archives it's remember those shots in lord of the rings of like the entire team just running through the mountains (laughs) of middle earth and it's just the most epic music i just picture that with us just running through the hills of dolly sods or uh someplace and yeah, no, so, the drone, like, it's going to happen. Like, if <laughs> I might just get one and we'll just go film drone stuff in our neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the Patreons are definitely helping us get there. Oh, this is true. Yeah. Well, I was just going to use my own money, but I could <laughs> use that money too. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I've used mostly all of my own money to buy all this stuff. Yes. So. Um, Robbie has been tremendous. No, I mean, we've, we've all used our money. I just mean that, like, we haven't used any of our paltry youtube ad money <laughs> to buy anything <laughs> which could buy us like half of a camera <laughs> could buy us maybe uh, like uh seven one batteries. fourth of a camera one fourth of a camera <laughs> i could buy us a good amount of batteries that would be pretty cool well, if you get the name brand one like the actual oh yeah yeah well, <laughs> speaking no, of batteries get, like, four batteries <laughs> anyway how many how many batteries and sd cards do we bring robbie oh, that is a good question so when we were using the canon t3i's we did have two th- canon t3i's for a while we had a packet we had little bags and we had um maybe 20 batteries <laughs> at our at the height of the batteries but they were third-party batteries so they didn't last very long each time since we've switched to the panasonic gh4 we carry eight batteries and those last much longer what, so ha- don't how many of them are the official ones so we have two official ones and then uh, six third-party mm. ones. So the official ones will easily last an entire day of filming, which is kind of incredible because I'm used to terrible camera batteries. But the non-official ones will probably last like half a day. And then SD cards. Uh, it's been a constant. Like batteries and SD cards have been a constant struggle. But most recently, I think SDs yes. have been more of one. <laughs> and like, I don't know how many. Yeah, gigs. like this. We got so many gigs. This one was 400 gigs. It was, it was close to 400 gigs. And, like, 
each card is 64 gigabytes, so you just need tons of cards. Yeah, and it never and since ends. we switched to 4K now <laughs> yeah. from 1080p. <laughs> Like we need 400 gigabytes. You're kidding. I had no idea it was that big. Yeah. Yeah. You're somebody well, was Red Rover Gorge was 320. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't that much more this time. That's like, well, I think it was three, you... 361 for Yosemite or something or. Oh, okay. Yeah. You could probably take all the pictures, all the digital pictures of, of like the 1990s and it would not <laughs> equal half of what we got in Yosemite. Yeah. And then so with the SD cards, we always joke about, once we fill an SD card, that's like all the content. So we always guard those with our lives. And we're like, look, like if, if it's life or death, you can let a battery go. You can let a camera go. But you risk your life for that SD card. You throw it up on the cliff and let yourself fall. <laughs> so many times we were joking in Yosemite. is like, if somebody fell off, it's like you throw the SDs at them and said, edit this. <laughs> it's worth it. Um, yeah, no so regrets. another another piece of uh, equipment, I guess you could say, that we have used, I guess, um, starting since Mammoth Cave, have been uh, lav mics. Oh, yeah. And um, if you pay attention, you can probably see them clipped to our shirts. <laughs> so that, yeah, those lav mics are a huge deal because, like, even the viewers, all of you guys, could you could hear the difference because lots of times we'd get complaints on the first few episodes, like, that they couldn't hear us. So then on the third episode, we bought this thing called a Rode shotgun mic, which mm-hmm. you put on top of the camera, and we thought that that would magically fix all of our problems. <laughs> but the big thing with sound and microphones is that the number one indicator of quality is how close the mic is to the sound mm-hmm. source. Like, you can have a really crappy mic, but if it's close enough to the sound source, it'll sound better than any expensive mic that's really far away. Mm-hmm. Because just you got to have a really strong signal for it. So a lav mic is something that you clip to your shirt, so it's right next to your vocal cords, and it gets a really nice sound. And it's kind of cool because you it makes the instantly makes the quality of the production look more professional. Like that's a big sound, hidden yeah. aspect of <laughs> professional video is sound. But with the lav mics came another challenge of um, managing another battery life, which was our phones. Oh yeah, because we use this app called RecForge on our phones to record ourselves. So now we always have to set our phones on airplane mode and and make sure we don't drain our batteries yeah and one thing that happened is like during in dolly sods they drained pretty quickly so we had to we realized we had to keep them like i kept it in my head uh unisock (laughs) next to my feet to keep it warm because the cold will suck the life out of batteries yeah and the program itself is so janky sometimes and like i don't know sometimes it won't record sometimes it'll stop recording i've never actually had a problem with the Oh, I have. But. <laughs> I think it's your phone. I think it's probably the broken screen, maybe. Um, but, it might be. but, you know, that that's another thing that, you know, about recording is when it's sunny, it's about as optimal as you can get. But then when when you take into account weather, it just throws a whole, a whole other wrench into things. Especially wind. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, wind, cold weather, like, screws batteries. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, in the Smoky Mountains, we had to deal with rain for, like, 60 percent of the trip and so we had like ziploc bags covering our cameras oh, yeah. to try and minimize any water you know and just having to deal with that and it just makes it just adds another level of, of irritation and, and like frustration when you're trying to get a shot you know speaking of the lav mics um so robbie recently switched to a recorder which i think we're going to do soon but we we used our phones to record things and I think, th- so there's a scene in Mammoth Cave where I'm using it, I'm fiddling with it. I think someone left a comment like, playing with your phone in nature or something, <laughs> like, <laughs> chastising me. I'm like, look, if I had any other choice, I wouldn't be using it. <laughs> it's on airplane mode. No, it's like. funny, like, that that comment, it's like, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's like a slap in the face. He's like, do you know how much effort it took for me to actually get out this phone, hook it up, <laughs> sync it, the audio afterwards, and now you're telling me that I was playing with my phone? <laughs> it was anything but playing. <laughs> I kind of take look at the whole issue of equipment and weather and all this stuff and all the struggles you have because none of it's ever perfect, right? Yeah. I kind of look at it as like the universe way, universe's way of saying, how badly do you want this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, how badly do you want to make a good video? Because I'll let you, I'll help you out. In fact, we're going to talk about this in just a second. <laughs> but um, there's a certain de- deity that we always talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
he he's always asking us. He's saying, "How bad do you want this, huh? You think you're you think you're working hard? You're not even close to working hard." <laughs> so yeah, his name is Greedo, and if you've ever seen Star Wars, yes, it's that Greedo. <laughs> Here's what happened: Andrew was editing the episodes, and as he's wont to do, he's doing it at like two or three in the morning. <laughs> and if you're ever going to get angry about something, it's at two or three in the morning. <laughs> so he's just like seeing how crappily we filmed these early pilots that we never released. And he created this whole like it, no, it manifesto. No, it was the season one episodes too, actually. Oh, really? Well, so, he made a whole manifesto. No, no, no. It was before Dolly Sod's episode one. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're then. right. Because we was, I remember we, we remembered the Greedo yeah. in that one. So he made this whole manifesto that's just like, oh, you're tired? No, you're going to do it anyway. Oh, you don't, your fingers are cold, so you don't want to clip the camera onto the tripod? Too bad. Do it anyway. <laughs> so we basically called it the Adventure Archives Creed. And then somehow when we were filming, that turned into assassin's creed and then eventually it turned into assassin's greedo and then eventually it just turned into greedo so now we so now yeah go ahead we, we have this like uh fake belief in this deity greedo who's always watching over us and we, we like it's actually it helps us helps motivate us but we're when, whenever we're in the wilderness we're like okay remember the greedo we got to get that shot and uh we joke about how like you know, you're on the beach and then suddenly there's one set of footprints and you ask Greedo, where did you go? You were walking right with me. And he says, when there was only one set of footprints, it's because you were carrying me on your back. <laughs> and I oh, was man, whispering in your ear, take the shot. <laughs> so that the metaphor even goes further. Like we... Um, we say Greedo shot first, or you have to be Han Solo and you have to shoot before Greedo shoots you. <laughs> but uh, it's actually gotten to the point where I, I ordered a Greedo action figure, and he now sits on top of my speaker looking at me. He's even got a gun pointed at me. And it's like, he's always looking at me. It's like, oh, you want to be lazy, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can, that be, solo. Can, that be, can that be the thumbnail to this podcast? Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah. All right, so if you're looking at the thumbnail, that's... This was decided now. <laughs> yeah, uh, Thomas, you remarked that it was really culty when we kept talking about it. <laughs> it was super culty. It's like you guys were uh, <laughs> getting ready for a seance to bring Greedo back from the fly <laughs> dead. Episode then, 7, man. <laughs> and then Andrew made a, a very simple flow chart to explain oh, how the Greedo yeah. works. <laughs> okay, so the flow chart says, uh, will the shot look good? Yes, maybe, no. And if it's no, it goes down and says, don't take the shot. If it's yes or maybe, it goes to another question that says, do you feel like taking the shot? Yes, no. And then both of those say, just do it. <laughs> and it's, um, and it's a picture of Shia LaBeouf with, with Greedo's head on it. <laughs> so I'm not sure if we've talked about that, but we have this thing called Greedo Church, where every now and then we'll just make something dumb that involves Greedo to like motivate ourselves. Like uh, one time Andrew made a Photoshop of Greedo with a lightsaber and then I made like a After Effects of Greedo's head on um, Michael Jackson screaming "Hey!" <laughs> <laughs> that one was funny. And um, uh. we every time we so we started doing these meetings to talk about Adventure Archives, and one of them is a band meeting from Flight of the Concords, <laughs> and all three of the characters have Greedo's head. Another one was the uh, Jedi Council meeting. No, well, so one of them was the small council meeting from Game of Thrones. <laughs> and, and, like, it was like people Greedo's head. The other one was the Jedi Council meeting, and it was every single Jedi with like Qui Gon Jinn, Anakin, and uh, 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 Obi Wan in the middle, <laughs> and every single person had Greedo's head. <laughs> I, I think you're, you're missing the best one, Andrew. Oh, which one? Oh, uh, Luke oh, with yes. Yoda on his back, oh, yeah. <laughs> with o, uh, with uh, Greedo as Yoda's face. <laughs> oh God! So good. I We're think gonna it put speaks that in volumes that Andrew has a folder on his computer <laughs> that is just Greedo faces for him to Photoshop on the yeah, things with the background <laughs> already <laughs> cut out properly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I was like, we're wasting so much time on these. I might as well make this. <laughs> Can I ask a serious question here? Yes. Getting away from Greedo for a little bit. Um, how much of this do you think actually kind of, you know, seriously though, how much of this do you think actually stems from kind of your, I don't want to say ego, but your enjoyment of seeing yourself on camera, like on a finished production? How much of your motivation comes from that? 
Hmm. Oh, I've got a great answer for this if you guys don't. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. My big thing is about that is is that in our culture, it's it's looked down to be excited to see yourself in the mirror on camera to talk about yourself and all this. But my big thing is if you're not your number one fan, who is going to be your number one fan? Like your mom is the only other person who will be as big a fan of you <laughs> as than anybody else. And you should be your number one fan. Like yeah, it's fun you don't to enjoy yourself on camera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, exactly. If you're not going to enjoy so, watching a finished product, then what's the point of even making it? So, I mean, for me, it's not an ego thing as like, oh, I can't wait for other people to see me. But it's, it is an ego thing in the sense that, like, yes, I love looking at myself on camera. Like, oh, yeah, good job. Good job. You look great out there, Robbie. You sound great. You did a good job getting this shot and everything. For me, it's like, I mean, I want to look good in the shots. But for me, it's more about, like, I think, well, overall, I want a good product that I can enjoy. And, like, if someone else was in there, I'd want it to be a show that I can enjoy. But um, I think a, a lot of it is, like, like, I want me to look good in the shot, but I also want to make sure what I'm doing is, like, competent. And a lot of times I've done things that are really incompetent, actually. And I, I look back on the episodes, and I'm like, God, why did I do that? Or, like, why didn't I do this? Or Yeah, like, I think that's also something that motivates me to make sure I learn more so that I can actually, like, speak competently about something we're doing. For me, I garner enjoyment from seeing a full completed product um yeah a full completed product just come together i think me and robbie have talked about this um but when you're editing the video you're like oh this is this is okay and then you start adding in the narration <laughs> and then you write the music and you put it in there and it's just so enjoyable to see everything come together in kind of like this harmonious unison <laughs> that you had pictured in your head and you just enjoy it so much and that that's kind of like what i you know like seeing in the very end when we finish an episode the music and narration is like the glue that meshes it all together <laughs> <laughs> yeah it really does and just just going back real quick to about greedo and as far as like ego and stuff i think the main motivation for all of us is we just want it to look we want it to be as best as possible like that is like the driving force behind everything we don't care about any of like it, there's no, nothing specific we care about we just like every meticulous detail we want to be perfect yeah yeah. so there's just like the greedo is like it's a we joke about it but it's actually not hard to do once you get into it because mm -hmm. you you can't live with yourself if you didn't go all out like every single time we are, are thinking like should we do this shot and should we take that effort for it if there's even a question then we know it's something we have to do there's a lot of times where we're editing and we're like oh man like every time we do one we see so much more room for improvement so it's like, that's sort of what the Greedo also is, is like just motivating yourself to make sure you do improve on these things. All right, now to address some of the other listener mail. All right, first question is from Seth Dombach, and he's asking, what's been our favorite moment in the wilderness, either while we're filming or on our own during our own trip, and what sticks out the most in our mind? I think we've sort of answered some of this, like to an extent with our own personal stories, but maybe those weren't our most favorite moments, so. Okay, so for me, there's so many different ones that, that it's like... It's hard to just pin down one because just picturing in my head right now, I can literally think of 10 different moments that I'm like, oh, God, that was so amazing. Like just a dumb one, like Zaleski, when we went by that one lake that had those beavers or oh, the, yeah. the trees not out by the beaver, like that memory is just like so indelibly etched in my mind that it just really sticks out. But probably the one that had the most impact on me uh, was the first time we went to the sand dunes at Sleeping Bear. That We went all the way down that huge sand dune that you saw in the episode. We actually went all the way down and had to climb all the way back up. But when we got to the bottom of that, it was just we were like the only ones there. It was quiet, and it was sunset. It was the most gorgeous thing, and up to that point, I had never experienced anything like that in nature before. So it was just really... A whole new world and experience and it really like honestly opened the doors to everything that we've done up to this point point. and if it weren't for that i don't know if we would be this excited about making videos and like making videos this much but that was actually the first time we started taking pictures and stuff too so it was kind of a yeah it really was the catalyst in a lot of ways yeah so for me there's a few moments during the filming that stand out um so i'll run through those really quick one is with morgan monroe hiking off trail and being out in that forest, like, 
in the valley of all these hills and being able to walk wherever you wanted, that was such a great feeling for me. Another one was in Hoosier when we were just like, I remember standing by this lake, the the big lake you see in the video as the sun's setting and then when the stars come out and just watching all the numerous stars. That was like an incredible experience. Um, Dolly Sods, the first night, just lying out watching the stars. Our most recent trip, also watching the stars. <laughs> Are you just going to take all of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you, you can use them. Okay. But, but my moment is one, um, that happened during a camping trip with a really good friend in Idaho. Um, not during the filming, obviously we were in the Sawtooth mountains and we had hiked in, uh, there was like no one else around. We were backpacking on a trail and the whole time we were hiking, we like, for some reason we had this feeling of anxiety because I guess we were in bear country and we had gotten there sort of late as I, we were wanting to do. Um, so it was like evening, and we were trying to look for a good campsite and we hadn't found one for a while, but finally we got one. We set it up. It was like on this rock and it like right over the ledge, you could see this waterfall in this river. And, uh, that evening we went on the trail a little bit and climbed up this like rocky slope on the mountains and sat up there and watched the sunset. And it started like drizzling lightly. I don't know if that was the evening actually, but we watched the sunset and then it was just beautiful. And then the next morning we went back up there and like it started drizzling slightly as the sun was rising and like you could see it all glinting through the raindrops and it was just like such a magical moment. And up up on that mountain slope you could just see like for miles and it was like, oh, it was an experience. Um, I think my favorite one was when we, I think we actually talked about it, but it was when we went to Hawking Hills with um, some of our other friends. The evening had set in and it was nice and warm. And obviously this was before the catastrophe of the freezing nighttime, (laughs) but we all went over to this little, um, it was just a little dike between like, um, the lake and we just lay out on the grass. And that was really probably the first time I had seen just so many stars in the skies and I was speechless. I was just left speechless. I was amazing. And I think that was like what really sparked like an interest in outdoor stuff because it was just like wow because i mean when you live in a neighborhood or anything like that you never really can believe how many stars you can actually see when you're out in the wilderness so it was just mind-blowing yeah if you think a city skyline looks great at night you ain't seen nothing <laughs> <laughs> okay so stan sonlin asks uh what international trail do you want to go on the most and um i guess for me i have two answers well one and a half answers one of them actually i don't know if it was you stan who even brought this up in the first place it might have been but there's like a prehistoric appalachian trail or something where it basically like it's trails all over like different like iceland or something and it's where like the appalachian trail would have been back when like all the continents were together or something like that i'm, I'm doing a terrible job explaining what it is but basically it's like where the Appalachian Trail would keep going on, like all the Appalachian Mountains, if um, the parts that broke off of North America were still together. Hmm. So it's like in Iceland and stuff like that, which is really cool. But I think one thing I would love to do is like hike the entire Great Wall of China. And I've actually heard you can go camping at some parts of those. Like, I think, I think like under or inside of the wall or something like that. But doing that would be pretty incredible, I think. Um, I went there three or two, two or three years ago and we like stayed at this we we went to part of the great wall that was sort of out in the country and we had a nice meal with these people and it was just beautiful and i don't know i think it'd be great i don't know of any international trails so i don't know specifically where i'd want to go but as far as just international travel man norway has always for some reason been like the place that i've been drawn to Uh, not just for the wilderness but i feel like the culture is really interesting to me too and um strangely i like a lot of their rap music (laughs) like (laughs) norwegian rap music is really cool actually uh for me i think you know i always hear stories about people going to the swiss alps Uh, i think that'd be something super interesting to do um because you just hear so many people talk about it and i don't know if i'd be able to handle doing the swiss alps but to actually to at least be able to go out there and spend a, a couple days at least out there would be really awesome. Yeah, sorry, Stan. We don't have many like very specific trails to mention, <laughs> but you get an idea. <laughs> also, I don't know if this counts, but another one that I've heard about, I don't know if I'd ever be able to hike it, 
is the Eastern Continental Trail, which I believe is part, or uh, I believe the AT is part of it. And uh, I think it goes like way up in Canada, all the way down to the tip of Florida. And then I think it, may, it might even go past that somehow, like you might take a boat or something. It looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I actually heard about that in some of the books that I read, um, where some AT hikers ran into other hikers who um, said they were hiking this Eastern Continental Trail, which is, and it's like crazy. It's like 5,000, 5,400 miles or something like that. Jeez. That's, I mean, that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of a bunch of stories and places we'd like to go and places we've enjoyed being, so we've done stories for me, Thomas and Robbie so far, and now it's time for Brian's personal story since this is the <laughs> fir- fourth episode. Okay, this is this story is um I think it's kind of funny. I don't know if you actually if you guys ever actually knew what happened when we first went to the Smokies and we split up. Wait, what? So no, I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when we first went to the Smokies, right? Oh, uh, we, oh the first time. The, so not the, the very episode, fir- yeah, the very first time we went to Smokies, it was me, Robbie, Andrew, and Thomas. And Andrew had planned this trail it was you right yeah yeah and this trail was pretty intense like we were still pretty much newbies to hiking and uh, we we had terrible gear <laughs> like our <laughs> backpacks were awful and um we got there late <laughs> obviously so we were hiking and we got to this river that we we're supposed to cross to continue our trail but it had <laughs> rained the previous few days so this river was serious business and we got to it and it was twilight was setting in and we were like there's no way we're going to get across this. We're not going to risk this. It was clearly a really strong yeah. current. That so you... what happened was we decided to go to a different campsite. We, we like took a different fork in the road and we went to a different campsite. We camped there for the night and then we hiked back. Basically we hiked mm-hmm. back to the parking lot and we decided to change our plans. It was at this point that Thomas and I basically chickened out. We were not like physically in shape to do it, I guess. Um, <laughs> And so Robbie and Thomas, or I'm sorry, Robbie and Andrew decided to do a smaller loop. Yeah, Jake's but, Gap Trail. <laughs> but they had, they were so like, <laughs> they they were. They, well, a- after that backpacking trip, we yeah, like. You we, dumped everything out of your backpack. Yeah, well, we had like these lanterns and Thomas had like <laughs> five wardrobes of clothing. <laughs> and like, like, like he had like two 50 gallon bags full of clothes and we had like these big lanterns no one needed. And we were like, okay, we're, yeah, we're yeah. emptying everything. <laughs> so, so you guys went on this loop and we're like starving the whole time. <laughs> so let me tell you what happened, what me and Thomas did while you guys were doing this. <laughs> so the first night we stayed at a nice campsite. In the morning, Thomas and I spent some time cooking pasta <laughs> and having a nice breakfast. <laughs> and then we drove to the nearby um, like tourist town. I think it was Gatlinburg. Mm-hmm. We went there. We went to a restaurant and, and had burgers. We sat down and had burgers in this restaurant <laughs> while it was raining outside. <laughs> and then after that, we spent um, the day kind of like just, you know, checking out some of the sites. We were driving around in a car. We were super comfortable. <laughs> and then I don't even know why I agreed to this, but Thomas was really in the mood for KFC. <laughs> So we went to KFC and we had KFC oh for dinner. Oh, Thomas. <laughs> and the Yo, whole time Yo. I felt super guilty. I was like, man, we are eating KFC and we're in the Smoky Mountains. <laughs> After that, we spent another night at a campsite and then we hiked like three miles in the trail just to meet you guys and we were com- <laughs> complaining the whole way <laughs> wait seriously <laughs> not, not really not really but i remember we were like we're like oh man we have to hike three miles to meet them like it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but so now I that i think back on that, that man it was just hilarious oh like oh my god <laughs> and i don't think I you guys ever knew <laughs> yeah i i had no idea you went to kfc and <laughs> that's like <laughs> That is hilarious because our experience was the exact opposite because we were starving. Yeah. But I have two reactions. One is Game of Thrones. Shame. Shame. <laughs> and shame. <laughs> <laughs> but but the other one is, is, you know what, man? If that makes you happy, dude, go for it. Like it's, <laughs> it, man. You can, everybody enjoys it on their own terms, you know? It's funny because I went with my friend to the Smokies one time and we're so tempted to go to this salt and pepper museum. <laughs> it's a salt and pepper shaker museum. <laughs> and we're like, man, that sounds like 
really fun. And they're like, what are we doing? We got to go hiking. <laughs> 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 but um, it's funny because like, I remember during our backpacking trip at the end, we had like literally two walnuts left in our bag. <laughs> 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 and I remember the night, like during night time, I would literally dream about eating food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like that was that in a way, like, especially now, like it was so fun. It was so fun to be that hungry. Like at the time, oh, I loved just it like, then too, actually. Yeah. It's at the time you're just so hungry. You just, food is all you can think about. You're just like, I, I can't imagine doing anything but eating for the rest of my life after <laughs> I get out of this. <laughs> and, um, I kind of did that. I don't know if we talked about that. I had two entrees. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I had a burger and fries and then I had, uh, like the prime rib dinner, the, the roast beef dinner or something i remember I that we were really hungry that was one of our best post hike meals too because we had like frog leg great. appetizers and uh oh man that was so good i still remember fried that. green tomatoes too yeah yeah andrew's trying to pull up his journal entry so he can specifically tell us <laughs> yeah so the restaurant we went to was called riverstone family restaurant and that was like so incredible we had fried green tomatoes frog legs Apparently, I got fried okra, turnip greens, mashed potatoes, and sweet potato fries. You got like a veggie <laughs> platter, like you get a bunch yeah, of sides. Yeah, I was vegetarian back then still. Uh, Brian got onion rings, sweet potato fries, shrimp. Thomas had mashed potatoes with open face roast beef sandwich. And Robbie had, uh, you had a burger with fries and lightly fried catfish and a baked potato. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, we also uh, had oh, fried cornbread. It was cornbread, Thomas who apparently. had that roast beef thing. Yeah, I, th I thought... Oh, yeah, that's right. You probably just... Oh, you ate his leftovers, I think. <laughs> yeah, you did. I remember that, actually. <laughs> Man, I was so full after that, but God, that was good. <laughs> I wish we had known the name after our last Monkey's trip, because that, that was a great restaurant. You brought your... Oh, no, you had... Oh, you know, I've got one. video footage of that, actually. Okay, well, I guess that um, brings us to a close on this podcast of Campfire Chronicles. Yes, please, again, support us on Patreon. Uh, there's an annotation linking to that. We appreciate your support. We love you guys. And feel free to leave any questions, comments, uh, topics of discussion that you'd like us to mull over live on microphone. <laughs> and yes, if you don't have any money, just share our videos. Yes, that, please. It yeah, takes. Share it with everybody you know. Print some flyers out. Put them at your community center. <laughs> shout, shout Adventure Archives at the top of your lungs. From Canvas. the top of your buildings. <laughs> Canvas your neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, please do share them. It helps a lot. And you can also check us out um, on Instagram. On Facebook. Twitter. And technically, Google+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will never, ever see anything you post on Google+. Plus. So don't use that. <laughs> but I'd say we're probably the most active on Facebook. So yes, yes. either check us out on Facebook or contact us on Facebook. Yeah. That's probably the best way to reach us. Mm -hmm. And as always, uh, if you have questions for the next podcast, go ahead and you can post them here in the comment section on YouTube. Or you can uh, post them on Facebook, too, in our uh, Facebook page. And we will definitely answer them next time. Okay, and that does it for this episode. Thank you guys for listening, and we are out. All right, well, I kind of got a pee, so I guess we can put that fire out. Mm, good job. <laughs> that was good. <laughs>